Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Edward once again. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll start now. Okay, for those who, uh, who just came in, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, due to safe management measures, we appreciate if you can understand that you will have to space out from the adjacent uh, non-family member. Huh? So if you're not related uh, by marriage or any other thing or family units, uh, please space yourself apart. Okay, I will see your understanding on this as well. All right. Okay, so uh, I'll do a quick introduction of our speaker today, Mr. Gung. Thank you for signing up for this workshop entitled 10 Common Mistakes Made by Parents. All right, uh, we, we know that Mr. Gung is not a stranger to you, whether you're from Mariah or not from Mariah. You know him personally. Uh, he's very involved in family life ministry for all these years. Right? He's currently a senior staff and also a counselor with Youth for Christ. And he also worships here in Mariah BP Church. All right? Periodically, he also preaches on the pulpit, uh, mainly talking about uh, family life uh, topics such as these. Right, so we really thank your time for coming and we pray that a lot this year, uh, this time now, when you come, uh, you are expecting to learn something, okay, uh, either through the word or through the personal sharing by Mr. Gung. So right now, we'll commit this session to the Lord in prayer. If you could just join me in prayer and bow our heads and we'll pray. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us here to Morabi Church today. Despite the rain, uh, you have kept all of us safe and brought so many of us uh, who are interested to, to learn more from you, Lord. Uh, may the Holy Spirit guide us uh, and prepare our hearts to hear, to receive your word, to hear your prompting, your instructions for all of us on how to be better parents for our growing children that we have. So we thank you for Mr. Gun, uh, who is so eager to share and his insights and his experience, life experience, uh, who you know, he has two children. I'm sure he has a lot to share and may you empower him. May your words uh, flow through him and convict him and allow us to really follow your ways. Lord. We do not want to follow after the ways of the world uh, that may distract us, that may you know, pull us in different directions, but we want to come back to you, come back to your word, and we want to just obey, obey you. So Lord, help us to listen, help us to also really meditate upon uh, your instructions as found in the Holy Bible. So we commit this time unto you. May we cast aside all distractions and to just devote ourselves to you for the next two hours or so. So Lord, we thank you, for we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me welcome all our friends from Emmaus. Nice to have you here. Looks like this is the Emmaus Club. I want to ask you a question. A little bit about your family, about you and your children. How many of you have kids, huh? That's in the age range between 8 to 15. Put up your hands. 8 to 15. Wow, a lot. Nah. 16 to 20. That's a lot of hands also. Those who have kids are in their 20s. What are you doing here? <laughs> anyway, that's a joke. Huh? That's going to be a joke. Do you, do you agree uh, that our children... Uh, Sometimes, regardless of their ages, uh, their behavior and their ages sometimes don't correspond. Do you agree with that? Do you find that your children, uh, sometimes even though they're in their 20s, uh, they're still very much like papa and mommy's boy and girl, uh, and with you, uh, they still behave like the kids? Yes? And some of them, in fact, not many, uh, when they were even in their pre-teens years, they show signs of great maturity. Anyone who has children like that? You probably think your kids are geniuses, huh? but they may not be. Okay? Now, there's another statement that people make. Mr. Gung, you know my kids, when they were in primary school or preschool, they are all like angels. But when they reach the adolescent years, they become little monsters. How many of you agree with that statement? It's very hard to understand and manage them. None? You don't have that? Okay, that is a very good sign. My job is easier today. I can go home with it. You see, 
I have found out, for me, I have found out, because I'm a father of three, my kids are all grown up now, that when my children reach the adolescent years, uh, they were quite challenging to me and my wife. You can check with my wife here. And I still remember that during those adolescent years, uh, I make lots of mistakes myself. I make tons of mistakes. In fact, today what I'm sharing with you uh, is a result of me making mistakes. In fact, I'm going to be very truthful. I'm going to be very vulnerable to you by telling you my mistakes. Is that okay? But please don't go and spread around. Lah, huh? uh, I'm going to be very honest because it's been a long journey. Now, I think and I believe that our children, when they reach their adolescent and teenage years, meaning from nowadays it's about eight to nine, you know, the adolescent year starts. When I was a teenager, it started and at about 12 or 13 when I entered secondary school. But it's getting younger now. Okay? Psychologists tell us that our children now reach adolescent years as early as eight and nine. And usually when puberty sets in, you know what puberty is, right? That's adolescent years. And there are a lot of issues involved. Now, I do not believe that our children, when they become adolescent, they purposely turn themselves into monsters. I don't think so. I do not think that our children purposely make life difficult for us when they become adolescents. But they don't have a choice. Many psychologists tell us that our children have to go through what, is, what I call the rite of passage. That means they must go through the teenage years, the adolescent years becomes before they become adults. There were times when my children were in the teenage years, which I wish uh, they would skip that, no? And they become straight away young adult there. But there's no such thing. I mean, no matter how much you wish that they grow up overnight, yeah, the adolescent years uh, cannot be avoided. And that's why today we have this talk. 10 common mistakes. Because the adolescent years really stretch the parents to the limit. I wonder if among us here there are parents who have cried over their children in the adolescent years, especially mothers. Can I see by a show of hands? How many mothers have ever cried over your children in adolescent years? Can I see by a show of hands? Cried, really cried. Yes. Fathers? Fathers? Men don't cry. Ah, not true. I cried a lot. I cried in my heart. My heart was broken. And I will tell you a bit more as I go on. Now, the fact is, our kids have to go through that rite of passage. If they skip the adolescent years, huh, then they will be incomplete when they reach the young adult. Put one gender. You know what I mean? Because the growth that is taking place in their lives, emotionally, spiritually, if you like, physically, are inevitable. They have to go through it for them to become, if you like, men and women of God, if you want the children to be godly people. They must go through it. Or, if you want them to become discerning, thinking adults, who are very good in discernment, who know what is hey pai, you know, be able to differentiate right and wrong, they have to go to that stage. And that is why your job and my job during those years are extremely challenging. And I believe that a lot of parents would have committed some form of mistakes along the way, especially if you treat your kids in their teenage years as if they are in their preteens. Get my point now? I'm, I'm giving you slips of truth. Huh? You look at this our boy, our girl, still the same our boy, our girl, but maybe by now a bit taller, a bit stronger, a bit more hairy, perhaps, you know? And then you treat this our boy, our girl, like the little our boy, our girl, you know? No more. He's still your our boy and our girl, but you cannot treat him or her like the preteens days. For example, a good example, huh? when my children reach their te teenage years, I wanted to hug them. And my daughter, I had two boys on the I wanted to kiss my daughter. Huh? Not comfortable with me anymore. Leh. And not because she reject me. Uh, in case father say, oh, yeah, my daughter reject me. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's because they are adolescent now. But they are not comfortable with you giving them that kind of a boy, a girl hug. Lah. You know what I mean? So if you don't have a paradigm shift, if you don't have the wisdom to now look at this young man or young woman in a different way 
and you are stuck with the same old method of parenting them, you are going to have a lot of friction. Do you agree with me? You are using the same method for this to this one. So, I want you to take note of that. And for today, I'm going to talk about actually five mistakes. I actually had a part one for this series. I covered the first five mistakes a long time ago before COVID came. Then I postponed, postponed, postponed until now. But for the sake of everyone, I'm going to do a quick review of the first five mistakes. Is that okay? So it's all in your notes. Now, once upon a time, I touched on a first mistake which a lot of parents would have made. Take note of this one. If you think it's very easy, the failure to admit when you are wrong. Think for a while. You probably say that Mr. Gong, we're all very humble people, we eat humble pie, we are Christians, sure one, when we do something wrong, we admit. Not quite true, you know. You know, as parents, sometimes when we make a mistake ourselves, usually we will know it. For example, you leave the room, you forgot to switch off the lights. Okay? And you already feel very bad. And then here comes your our boy or our girl telling you, reminding you that you didn't switch off the lights there. And the electricity bill is going up. How do you like it? You're going to say thank you. Uh, thank you for telling me. Uh. No. Most of the time, I hated it. You know what I mean? I already felt very guilty. And here comes my, my daughter or my son reminding me of my mistake. Now, but friends, during the adolescent years, uh, if your kids are really sharp, uh, and I assume that they're like you, you know, because you are sharp, uh, so you give them to sharp kids, uh, true or not? You cannot give a birth to non-sharp kids. Uh. Your children will expose you quite a lot, and you will be able to catch your tail a lot. I've got three kids. Oh, they are my greatest detective at home. They catch my tail most of the time. And there were times in which I did not like it. For example, if you come to church late and they tell you, we are late again for church, how do you like? How many of you here can say, you come to church punctually every Sunday, put your hand? Nobody, right? In fact, some of you here are like me, like that, sometimes quite late one. Then they tell you, no, how we are late, you know? This is a nice thing to be a Christian, and you really feel bad inside. And then the, 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 our, our boy, our girl will point out to you. Let me tell you a true story. There was a single parent father, in a single family father. This guy, having divorced the wife, was left to be the custodian of two kids in their teenage years. The father was constantly a very moody man, temperamental, and had a problem with his temper. He constantly struggled as a single parent with parenting the kids. And he did not know how to be a good father. Nobody taught him because he grew up in a home where the father was absent. He would discipline his kids according to his moods. In other words, on some days when he's in a good mood or he had a good day in the office, and if he comes home and the children misbehave, he will close one eye or close both eyes. But on those days, when he was in a very foul mood, and the children make a lot of noise or misbehave, he will be very angry and he will discipline them. One day he received a call from the school teacher saying that his boy had just a fight in school and that the teacher asked the father to come home and address the issue. He came back home he called his son, the older son, in his teenage years, and without questioning him, took out a belt, his belt, uh, and wiped the boy. He wiped, it, wiped him, wiped him. And after a while, he saw the blood coming up from the son's leg. He broke down and he cried. And this father cried. And the son got a shock. Look at the father. This father, this big man, cried. And then the father uttered those words. And his son, I never had a model to follow myself, what it is like to be a good father. But I want to be a good father to you. 
but I don't know how. Would you help me? Would you forgive me? And the son was so shocked. And he saw the father's cry. He also cried. And father and son had a good heart and they cried together. But in a very strange way, after the episode, the son had a new understanding and a new respect for his own father. And the father and son relationship became great from that on. Not overnight, but you know, he improved because the son for the first time saw the vulnerable side of the father. The son for the first time saw the father breaking down. And the son find it easy now to accept the father. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm asking you to think about this mistake. Because all of us, from time to time, would have made some mistakes in the sight of our children. And I would strongly advocate that if you are caught in that moment, remember the three magic phrases. I will offer them FOC to you. Three magic phrases. I am wrong. I'm sorry I'm wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry I am wrong. Please forgive me. Now, if you could after those words, huh, friends, you will find that those words have great magical power. You know what I'm going to say? They're simple words. But when the children grow up in the adolescent years, they need to see their parents having made mistakes, acknowledge their mistakes. Now, you talk about humility, you talk about godliness, right? Our children must learn that, that we make mistakes. And we do confess our sin, for example. You know, when I was a school teacher, before I went full-time, some of you might have known that, I was a school discipline master in a mission school. Some of you are laughing. I probably remember those days when I was a discipline master. And I was a very strict one. And don't look at my size. I could be a strict discipline master. So I would have to handle discipline cases almost every day in that school. And there were many days in that school where I caught students being rude, being defiant to the teachers. And when I pulled them to the office, all that I asked for is that they apologize to their teacher. And I will close the case. Very simple, right? They refuse. Most of them refuse. They refuse to say sorry. So I cannot settle for the teacher, right? So I called the parents. Then I asked the parents, after persuading them, telling them about the kids having committed some mistake in school. So, do you say sorry at home? Ah? And most of these uncle and auntie, ah, we never say sorry at home. Ah. That's not in our language. No, what does it show? It shows that when we parents, having made mistakes, never had the courage to confess to our children, our children will make mistakes and they won't repeat those words, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. So, the next time, if you want your kids to learn about confession, to learn about humility, I suggest that you think seriously. Too violent again. Sorry about the breakdown. I do get a bit violent when I'm teaching. Now, sometimes we say that you know, how come our kids uh, don't confess or admit that they are wrong? I suggest you do a bit of soul searching. Now, the next mistake, all this will cover the last time. Failure to be consistent. I like to say that inconsistency uh, is a a consistent problem with parents. All of us, in one way or another, would have been inconsistent without our knowledge. And sometimes, as Christians, as church-going people, we can actually be seen to be inconsistent. There was this story of a devout Christian father, a very devout Christian family. And one morning, 
the whole family came together for breakfast. And as usual, the father started with giving thanks. Most fathers do, right? And his father prayed a beautiful prayer of thanking God. You know, it's one of those days when a man feels really inspired and thank God for this, thank God for that. After the long prayer, then everybody was so happy to dig in. And they all started consuming their bread and their beverages. But at the same time, the father, after that long prayer, started complaining that the coffee was too hot. The toast was not well done. And the jam was too sweet. And he went on and on. And this got the son attention. And the son asked the father, Dad, do you think God will take your prayer seriously or your complaint more seriously? Now this is inconsistency. Do you agree? You, you were just given thanks. But the next moment you complained. Now, and I think many of us will have been caught nah, again and again and again. And it happened during the adolescent years because now your kids are, are smart and sharp enough to notice it. When they were in preteens, the little darling, a boy, a girl, right? You probably get away with it. What do you think? You know, the teenage years, they're sharper now. And you know how to detect their parents' inconsistency. My advice to parents is be aware of your inconsistency. And my prayer for myself, my prayer for you is that we will work at being a consistent parent. Ask God to help us. Whenever our children make certain comments in exposing us, take them seriously. And sometimes you need feedback from your wives, your husbands, from your children to remain consistent. At home, my children, once in a while, tell me straight in my face, I'm consistently inconsistent. That means they see all my flaws, huh? that I do this, I say this, but I practice something else. And sometimes as a preacher, as a preacher of God's word, it's even more challenging. Don't you agree? They see your life and conduct, and because they are teenage years, now they are no more blur, blur, gong, gong, you know. They can tell. So, inconsistency. The next mistake that parents make in parenting teenagers is the failure to give honest answers to honest questions. There will be times when our children will ask us honest questions. And sometimes the questions are beyond us. For example, if they ask you a very difficult question from the book of Revelation, I'm using Revelation example, huh? extremely challenging book. And sometimes we are caught, no? we are tongue tied. So what do we do? How do you respond? Some parents, or Mr. Gung, when they ask us topic, I change topic, lo. I change frequency, lo. or siam, lo. or I pretend I didn't hear them, or I simply keep quiet. Now, when you do that, na, your parenting process of your teenagers become extremely difficult. It may not be anything to do with the Bible. It may have to do with something in terms of husband and wife relationship. You know what I mean? Say, Mom, why do you get so angry with that? You know? You know what I mean? And then you're caught, you know. Because it's true, they saw it that you lose your temper with your husband. Or they ask you, why didn't you keep a promise to them? And you did not keep a promise. Or you make some comments. About their, children, about their friends, and they ask you a question, you do not know the answer. The fact is, parents of teenagers uh, will find ourselves in awkward situation from time to time. Because your kids are smart, and they're as smart as you, if not smarter. They will ask you difficult questions. So what to do? This is my advice. Every time our teenagers ask us a difficult question, we must try our best to answer. Our kids deserve an answer. And if we do not have the answer, we let them know, I don't know. I will try to find the answer for you. 
Sometimes they ask you questions about the Bible, and if you do not know, please don't bluff. I know our parents will bluff their way through. And when the children find out, it's very embarrassing. It shows for <laughs> your lack of spirituality. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see, when our teenage kids are looking for answers, uh, they deserve our listening ears and understanding. And when parents make efforts to provide answers, they are sharpening their children and reasoning skills and discerning skills. Actually, you forget that the process of trying to answer them, help them in developing their reasoning skills. And this is the best way to protect our teenagers. Your children need to learn from you how to sharpen their skills. So in the process of engaging them, or trying to answer them, or even saying, I don't have the answer, but I will check for you. Or when I know the answer, I'll let you know. You are actually protecting them. You're helping them to develop thinking and analytical skills, which I'm afraid a lot of our forefathers, huh, you know, our parent generation, they did not know how. Do you agree? Sometimes I remember my parents telling me, you shut up. You know, shut up. Shut up sounds very easy, right? But do we really shut up? Do you shut up? Did I shut up? Inside, yeah? you know, inside, inside, you didn't shut up. Very hard to shut up. Hard to swallow. But you shut up. And why did they do that? Because they did not see a need to answer our honest questions. So friends, I want you to take note that there will be moments when your children want to engage you. And they ask honest questions. To me, they deserve an honest answer. If you cannot answer, let them know you don't have the answer. It is okay. The next failure is the failure to differentiate the critical from the trivial. Xiao ti da zuo, da ti yu xiao zuo. I believe that in our daily living, parents and teenagers face all kinds of issues. And parents sometimes overreact. We lack the ability to see things in correct proportion. Small things, we react. But big things, we leave them alone. Years ago, in the years when I was still leading the word of youth guidance, working with troubled family and troubled young people, one couple came to seek my counsel. The father was a pilot. The mother was a doctor. Highly intelligent, right? They came to see me because they had one son who liked to eat chicken wings with coke. Chick a, lot of chicken, a lot of KFC chickens. And he was not eating a healthy diet. And they came to see me and I wonder why your parents didn't see me, you know? You know, I, I was getting a bit impatient because they were into healthy living. Healthy diet. Sounds familiar, or not? So they always quarreled and reacted over the food that the children consume. Now, I'm not saying food is not important. Uh, food is very important, right? Food is important, right? But the fact is, they were reacting, overreacting over trivial issues. And I think this is where God's people need the wisdom of God to discern between what is trivial and what is critical. And I put to you, that we need to differentiate between trivial and critical issues. Please keep your sword for the critical battles. Pick your battles. If you know what I'm saying, if you were to go through all the issues with your children and, and get bothered and get worked up and disciplined or quarrel with your kids or quarrel with one another over trivial issues, then this is a very big blatant mistake. So in your prayer, in your understanding of your teenagers, you need wisdom from the Lord to differentiate. I give you some examples of what I think are critical issues, okay, as Christians. Integrity and dishonesty are critical issues. It had to do with character. Do you agree? If you found your, your, your boy or your girl lying to you, or cheating, you do it this honesty and integrity. That one, you should address it. 
if you are teenagers, bring boys or girls at home and close the bedroom door, that can lead to sexual misbehavior. To me, that's critical issue. Do you agree? But not all Christians agree with that. No? I know some parents allow their children bring boyfriend and girlfriend into the bedroom, you know. Abuse of drugs. I mean, they take drugs, right? That is critical issue. Their faith in God. Don't you think it's critical? Yeah. I mean, you want to raise God-fearing kids. Rejecting of moral values. Then usually, these are the trivial issues. In their teenage years, they want to keep certain hairstyle. That is trivial. Do you agree? I'm saying that now because I went through that with my children, you know. I am a typical Chinaman. And if you look at my hairstyle, you look at me, I'm a traditional Chinaman. So when my older son reaches teenage years, I make sure I walk him to the barber. And I make sure the barber gave him a four by two haircut. No four by two or not. Four finger here, four finger here, and then two finger here. And it reached a point where it became a great tension. You know what I mean? At the barber shop, so the father look at me and look at my son. So who do I want to listen to? And I had a problem. And he took my very wise wife to tell me, I uh, give up your control button now. Uh, eh? Very wise woman here. Give up your control button. Then I repented. And from that day onwards, no more issue. My son and I no longer have a haircut issue. Eating habits. To me, not critical also. La. Correct or not? Sometimes, personal hygiene. I don't know about you all. Huh? I know huh? some parents are OCD one. Huh? Brush teeth three times a day. And then you must inspect some more. A boy, a girl. Eh? Okay? Personal hygiene. Use of leisure time. To me, by the time they reach those years, huh? if you have certain guidelines, you don't have to control the leisure time. Next, sometimes saving and spending. They need some freedom in spending. So all this you have to work out, you know, but you need the wisdom of the Lord nah, to differentiate between trivial and critical. And please pick your battle. Now, why do I say pick your battle? You see, if parents fight with their children over every issue in life, nah, small and big, when finally the big issue crop up right, they won't listen to you anymore. They treat you as an enemy. So you lost your battle in the small issues. Keep your sword and your battle for the big thing. And believe me, it works. Because your children know when you are addressing them seriously. And when they know you are serious, they will also get serious. But if you fight with them over small issues, when they come to the big issues, they will say, ah, one of those times when mom or dad nag. And nagging is real. Nagging is a real thing. Parents tell me, Mr. Gung cannot blame me in why I nag, you know. I nag because I tell them once, twice, thrice, they don't listen. So I nag, no? I keep nagging. Nagging is forgivable. But the children hate it. They hate this nagging thing. So how do you find a way to communicate with them? Pick your battles. Effective parenting is about picking your battle. I talk about this one. I believe that it is quite common for parents to communicate disapproval rather than approval a lot of times. Many of us we know our kids so well. And depending on our temperament and our own standards, some of us are very quick to see where our children fail to make the mark. You know what I mean? We fail to see that they have not done their best. Put it differently. Can I say that? And if you are a well-read and knowledgeable parent, you tend to see where your children fall short of the mark. And if you're a kiasu parent, worse. In other words, during the teenage years, we tend to see the not-so-good side of our 
teenage kids. We tend to see our cup as half empty rather than half full. That means we see the negative side very fast. We tend to see their flaws. We tend to see their bad habits and we fail to see their strength. And therefore, we're very quick to criticize rather than affirm. Many of us parents, because of the knowledge explosion, today we can see our kids and our children can sense from our body language, from our facial expression, in the way we look at them, whether we convey approval or disapproval. And to make things worse, I found out that Asian parents, uh, people like us, uh, are not so strong in affirming our kids. Leh. You agree? My, my parents told me, cannot praise us one already, you know. Gina mtang ulu. Ulu wa tau tua. That means, bam, the head explodes. Lah. They have this thing, you know, they believe in that one, you know. So when I grew up, I hardly had praises for my parents, and I was dying to have affirmation. I was dying, you know, to hear the affirmation. Hardly. Now, friends, brothers and sisters, you need to affirm your kids. You need to fill up their emotional tank. Your kids, your teenage kids, have a great emotional tank that need to be filled up with your affirmations. Why do I say that? Because very clear studies on human behavior have shown that when children grow up and seldom praised by their parents, they become very critical of other people. They become very insecure. So the key towards raising secure kids, uh, to me, uh, the key is affirmation. Eh? I'm asking you to affirm your kids. I'm not asking you to flatter your kids. Ah, that's a different, eh? You know it's flatter or not? You know, pai ma pi, you know? Pai ma pi, that means that you go around and every day, every night, eh, you did it. You place your ah, boy, ah, girl, eh, sky high, you know? Now, what is the difference between a good affirmation and a flattery? Let me give you my definition, okay? Listen carefully, yeah? When you flatter a person, you're telling a person something nice, uh, which the person did not earn it, did not do anything for it. For example, a person with nice hair, black hair, by nature very nice black hair, right? And you praise the person for whatever reason. The person did not earn it. He's, he's got just black, nice black hair. He got a very nice high beach nose. Then you keep on praising the nose. The person didn't earn it. But in an affirmation, the person deserves it. It means they've done something that is commendable. That is not flattery. Are you able to see the difference? So your children do not need your flattery. They need your affirmation. And please give them. Because their emotional thing has to be filled. Parents, please make an effort to affirm their teenagers all the time. Look for little day-to-day -day task, duties, or whatever they have shown to you and affirm them. Don't believe the old wise tales about their head exploding. Love them and affirm them. I have a feeling that this new generation of parents, especially those of you in your 30s and 40s, you're quite, quite good at it. Am I right? How many of you believe in affirmation? Put up your hand. I should have you as my parents, man. Because I was dying for it. Yeah, so the new generation, great. Please keep doing. So those are the five failures, the five mistakes that parents commonly will make. I'm going to move on to the next five. But before that, do you have questions for me? You can have the mic, you know, you can have the mic if you have questions. And if you're asking questions, you can take down your mask and ask me questions. I was told that you'll be sterilized later on. You need to take your mask because I'm getting deaf already. I'm wearing hearing aids here, you know. 
So if you speak through your, your mask, I can't quite hear you. Okay. If you have questions before I move on to the next five mistakes. No question? Wow, very good. No questions, huh? So I can move on. Now the sixth mistake about teenage, parenting teenagers is we have a tendency to disapprove of their friends when you get to meet them. In Chinese, we say that our children's friends are two peng gou yo. Not two peng gou yo. I'm using a Chinese uh, phrase. Uh, two means pig. La. Gou means dog. La. You know, we use this very degrading term. Now, why do I say that? You see, by the time your kids reach teenage years, uh, we parents would have become quite sharp and discerning and experienced we have little problem in sizing up our children's friends. You look at them, you can tell. You agree? Not just by appearance, but by the way they talk, from the way they carry themselves. So you can tell whether these friends are good influence or bad influence. Can you tell? I'm not asking you to go around judging people. Eh? I'm not thinking about that. But you can tell because if your, 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 your son or your daughter bring them home and you observe them. And usually because of our protective instincts, we want to protect our kids from negative influence. We have a tendency to quickly criticize their friends whom we think might be a bad influence for them. And we do this with good intention. We want to protect our children. Don't we? I remember my parents did that to me. Okay? But quite often it backfired. It has backfired. I remember when I was in my secondary three days, one day a group of friends came to visit me in my, in my home. And the moment these kids entered my house, each they were at the gate, my father saw them. And looking at their behavior, my father told me straight away when they left that these people could be a negative influence for you. And the fact was my dad was right. You know what I mean? But he did affirm what I kind of knew. You know what I mean? But how come they were my friends? They were unwelcome friends. I didn't invite them. They came to our door. And then my father saw them and warned me and said they were negative influence. My father is quite sharp in that sense. Now, parents... Sometimes your judgment could be right. Sometimes your judgment could be wrong. Now, I met a frustrated, worried mother some years ago when I was doing this series of parenting talk. This mother had a daughter who was about 16 attending one of the convent schools in Singapore. Now, convent schools are good schools. They usually, I don't know now, huh, but at the time it was good school. The girls are all very decent. They're not nuns. Huh? They are convent school. Convent has high standard. And in fact, in Singapore, if you come from convent, CHIJ and all that, right, you're considered good school. Lah. However, this girl, this daughter, who was a very quiet girl in primary school, when he, she reached secondary school, she began mixing with a group of girls. And... These girls taught her drinking, smoking, swearing, and dying of hair, and a whole lot of them. They were a bunch of aliena. And with good intention, this mother advised the daughter to leave the group of friends because they were not a good influence for her. And she tried very hard by criticizing her friend in front of her. You got it? telling her all that she knew as a mother, what these girls were like. Unfortunately, this approach had an opposite effect. The daughter got even closer to that group of friends and the relationship between mother and daughter turned sour. The daughter hated it. She just didn't like the mother criticizing her friends. And this went on for quite a while. 
and the mother had enough common sense, good sense, to change tactics. She stopped complaining about her friends. She accepted her friends by not criticizing them and even invited her friends to their home and tried to get to know each one of them. After months, you know, a number of months, the daughter opened up and confided in the mother and told her what she thought about her friends. And interestingly, the mother and daughter then took time, without the mother, ju mother judging the, her, her friends, uh, they took time to analyze the friend's behavior. And a short while later, the daughter made her own decision to move away from those alien. And what's the bottom of the story? Our children, having grown up for, with, with us, uh, actually knew our standards and our values. Wouldn't they? They know what you, what you subscribe to, what you believe in. But during the teenage years, their friends represent something in their life. It represents a great significant part about their lives. So when the parents criticize her friends, it was seen to be an attack on the daughter herself. In her mind, she told the mother, you are attacking my friends. You know what I'm saying? The sense of possession, the sense of knowing that these are her friends, her choices, make her get angry and disgusted with my mother, the mother. You see, during those teenage years, uh, peer pressure and peer influence uh, are very powerful. Eh? Now, you try to recall your own adolescent years, and I recall my own adolescent years. Uh, during those years, uh, what our friends did, uh, we easily subscribe to that, no? We call it peer influence. Uh. Do you agree? Let me tell you, I came from a very traditional Chinese home. Okay? My father was traditional, my mother was traditional. But in, in the 60s, when I was in secondary school, uh, I fell in love with the Beatles and the Rolling Stone. Have you heard of them? Pretty historic uh, for you. You know the Beatles? You know the long hair, then the yeah, 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 you know? And then, now I look back, why did I do it? No? Why did I follow? And I had those pop songs, you know? Because my friends sang those songs. My friends subscribed to them. So I followed along. Uh, I even tried to pick up Smokey and very, very proud, you know, put a packet of cigarettes in my pocket you know, and then show to my friend. Why did I do it? In fact, smoking was a horrible thing to me. But why did I do it? Because my friends did it. You understand this peer influence thing? So you need to understand that in the teenage years, when you are raising your kids, you have to contend with all the environmental factors in your our boy and our girl's life. The friends, the influence. And I'm sure your kids, based on the ages you mentioned just now, they would have followed some of their friends' pattern. So, churches, same thing. If one young person buy ESV Bible, you know ESV? A lot of people buy buy ESV. One person buy NIV, all the rest will follow. You know they have this thing to follow one. If you need to sing and talk even Christian language in a certain way, peer influence. Of course, today in churches, we talk about creating positive peer influence. Lah. But peer influence is still peer influence. My advice to parents is this. Even if you are not comfortable with your children's friends, it is best to bite your tongue. You know, bite your tongue? Don't speak unless it is necessary. Avoid open remarks open criticism, but try to ask intelligent questions, questions that stimulate thinking and soul searching in your teenagers. What do you think of this friend? What do you think? Let him or her answer. And of course, ask without that kind of interrogation look. Lah. You know some people, interrogation, in a very relaxed and what do you think of the friends? How do you feel when you're together? You know, I mean, ask your, your, your son or daughter, how do you feel when you're with this friend? You'd be surprised what your children will tell you, you know. Under the same circumstances, would you follow his conduct? Let's say this guy, you heard him swearing and cursing. Then you, when you're alone with your boy or girl, you ask, would you follow his conduct? You know what I mean? 
So if you ask questions like this in a non-interrogation way, I believe you actually are engaging your teenagers. And you believe me, your teenagers actually would have known a lot about your core values, about your belief, your viewpoint, including your fear and apprehension, because they are your children. From young, you have raised them in a certain way. You know, I grew up in my teenage years, and I didn't discover that until I went to do NS. I was in Safti then, and I was going to the Salita River one day to do crossing water obstacles. I was almost drowned, and I found out that I was having a fear of water without knowing it. And later on, when I recall, I knew that it was my father who couldn't swim, who had impacted me with the fear of water. You know what I'm trying to say? So, mom and dad, your fears, what you are fearful most, you will have in one way or another impacted your children. What you admire will have impacted your children. If you truly admire the Lord Jesus Christ, your admiration of Christ would have impacted your children. You know what I mean? So, have no fear if you trust the Lord and you raise your kids in a certain way. They have known your core values. It's just that during the teenage years, the peer influence is still very strong. And it's like a tug of war. I don't have the picture here. And I, I like to draw this tug of war when I help telling parents about uh, helping their own children. On this side, you are the parents and the school teachers and the counsellors. And that side will be all their friends and all the outside influence. It's a tug of war. You know what I mean? You are pulling and their side is pulling. And you need to pull intelligently. You need to pull with synergy. Husband and wife need to pull together. You need to pull as a team. I call it tag team. Lah. You know what I mean? But sometimes I don't see parents pulling as a team, you know. I see parents fighting over who is right, who is wrong in parenting. And I'm telling you this. Listen very carefully. It don't come from my heart. It's not in my notes here. When your marriage relationship with your spouse is not in order, it will be very hard for you to parent your child with synergy. Because your marriage is suffering. Your parenting process will also suffer. Do you understand me? Therefore, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in this twin package, marriage and parenting. They are not mutually exclusive. Marriage and parenting. And I've seen it now. Most of the time, I enter a family helping the, the young person. I end up helping their parents' relationship. I've seen it all the time. And that's why it took me so many years. You know, all this is, Mr. Gung, what are you doing, family? I said, so we love it. You know, so we love So we want to. Every time I enter a family, I, I, I had to start with dealing with the, the teenagers who have broken the law or going to RTC and all that. I end up doing with the parents. And I put to you that our marriage relationship is extremely sacred, extremely important in the eyes of God. You put that in order, you find that parenting is much easier. You neglect it, parenting becomes very difficult. You follow me so far? Okay, that is my selling koyo for the four phases of a good marriage. Now, remember, our children's friends are important to our friends. Now, the next one. Failure to give your teenagers the right to fail. You know, your teenagers, they have the right to fail. I'm not asking you to purposely fail them in every area of life. In their eyes, they need to know that you give them the right to fail, the right to try it again. And this is particularly common, this failure is very common among controlling parents. Parents who are very successful themselves, or high power. This kind of parents usually find it hard to accept their teenagers setback and defeats in life. And most of these parents will do everything they can to shield their kids 
from failure and adversity. These are the parents who was quite often go to schools and not agreeing with the school teacher or the school discipline system to make sure that their children are protected and not punished. Have you seen that in school? I've seen a lot of them. And these are the parents quite often who will not release the control button. Listen carefully. If our teenagers are not experiencing setback and disappointment and failures, then they are not growing up. In Chinese, we say, If they are not experiencing setback, disappointment, failures, it's hard for them to grow up. If our teenagers have never learned hardship and setback, they will not be complete. And that's why we have people who are physically grown up, but in their mind, they behave like kids. Why? They didn't go through that whole process of failure and getting up again and moving on. Now, friends, this quality called resilient, uh, R-E-S-I-L-I-N-T, uh, is a very powerful, important quality in your life and in my life and our children's life. You no, know resilient means bouncing back. They have to learn what it means to bounce back. Every parent's reaction uh, to his teenager's moments of defeat uh, and failure is a test of the parent's own sense of security and parenting skills. For example, if your boy go to NS and we say, kena tekan by the instructor, tekan, uh, how will you handle them? You know, tekan means they suffer setback, humiliation, and scolding. But now these SAF soldiers are very friendly already. I understand that SAF, uh, they are more keen uh, to say all the nice things to you than all the negative things. And I think that is bad. They don't suffer anymore. Okay? I wish that our soldiers behave like soldiers now. And when they go through those moments and they come back to you and say, Pa, Ma, my corporal tekan me, you know. How do you handle it? I have a feeling today some parents will go to and complain to the SAF officer. But not in my time. Because soldiers have to go through hardship. Agree? That's part and parcel of training. So, when your boy and girl suffer setback, what do you do? I put to you, a secure parent, a highly secure parent, secure in Christ, can accept the teenager's failure calmly. <coughs> a very insecure parent will react strongly to the child's failure. It is very revealing to study each parent's reaction when the child comes home with a bad report card. Of course, no parents want to see a bad report card. But what the parent will say or will do after the initial disappointment is very revealing. In my teaching day, again, there was this thing called Meet the Parents Day. Is this, you have it? Do you have it right? Ah, yeah, I've met all kinds of parents. And uh, we wait for the result to be released to them, you know. So as a form teacher, and I was handled O level one. And all my years, I handled O levels. Right? Maybe, was it O level? Yeah, all O level. And then uh, parents came. And the moment I showed them the report cards, uh, the first reaction, uh, tell me whether they're secure or not. You know what I mean? Straight away. I can tell straight away. The way they look at the child. The way they look at me. Sometimes they think it's the teacher's fault. That the, their son or daughter fail. I can tell you, I can, I can tell on their face. They blame everybody except, you know. Now, I want you to take note of this, friends, that our children, for all that they are, they have the right to fail. And we need to embrace them, love them for their failure. Because they're still your son. Let me tell you a true incident about my, me and my son. Okay, in case you want to know how old my older son is, he's 39 years old now. The year that was quite some years back, I, I, I have just left teaching. I, I went to pastoring, pastoring ministry and I was giving tuition to support myself. And one fine day, I was driving home and my, um, 
I got a, the indosis was a pager, my wife pitched for me, and um, I responded to her. She told me that my son has got his report card. He was in SEC 1 then, and he did not want to see me at all. He got his report card. So you guess what it was? He got his report card, but he wanted to avoid me. And I asked her what happened. My wife told me that he failed his literature, SEC 1. And when I received the call, I was very angry. I was a controlling father. And to make things worse, I was a school teacher. So I say to myself, when I go back home, are you going to get a hard time for me? I'm going to give my son, give it to him. But thank God, when I was driving home, I prayed. I told the Lord that I was very angry, I was very upset. But not to do. I love him, but not to do. So I reached home. My son, I called him. He stayed in the room, didn't come out. Then after that, after I shouted at him, he came out sheepishly. I said, son, I want to see your report card. You dare not take report card. I said, please, I want to see a report card. So he took out. Then he showed me. True enough, he missed the passing mark by a few marks. So I saw the red mark in literature. In a very strange way, now I look back, it was a very mysterious thing. A deep sense of peace was upon me. I didn't react. I look at him and he didn't look at me. And I call him, son, come here. And then he sheepishly got close to me. And I gave him a hug. I gave him a kiss. And he got a shock of his life. This strict, horrible father would do that to him. But I feel my little I said, but I love you. Do you try your best? I did. I said, okay. So I signed the report card. And the rest was history. He went on to do his O-level. And he passed his literature at O-levels. If you ask me, the Lord intervened in my fathering journey. And today, my son lectures literature in the university. <laughs> How do you make up for that? God, and here I was, an anxious and insecure father. Failure is the mother of all success. I want to stress this. Parents, you have the duty to give your teenagers the right to experience failures. Every episode of failure can be used by the Lord to educate your children about bouncing back. It can be used to teach your children about starting all over again. Never send the message, this is the end of the world, when they fail. I'm afraid I've seen a lot of what they call panoroid, pa no, panoroid parents, they're, they're, they're panoroid themselves, you know. The anxious parents, they, they kick out fast and it's the end of the world for them when they look at the children's failure. No, don't do that. They have a right to fail. If you ask me, godly parents could use their kids' failure to talk about God's grace, about God's forgiveness, about God's unconditional love. I'm going to talk about that at the end of this. It's the most powerful moments when the child knows that he's not up to it. But we have a God who loves us for whom we are. It's the best moment to talk about grace. You see, we all talk about grace all the time as Christians. But how do we talk about grace? The moments of failure. You know what I mean? They know they have let you down. They know they have suffered feedback. They know they have not made the grade. And you tell them about the grace of God and about their worth in God's eyes, about self-esteem. Our children need to be assured by us that we love them for whom they are, not for what they do. See the difference? I'm going to talk about that later on at the end. They need to know that we love them for whom they are and not for what they do. The trouble today with our kind of society, and I'm afraid it has to do with our meritocratic society, we stress so much on what people do rather than what they are. But when God looks at us, He looks at what we are, not what we do. Am I right? God looks at us for what we are. That's why there's a hymn, Yes, as I am, I come to thee, O Lamb of God. What we are. See, today, if we preach about God love us for what we do, something is wrong. It's not the gospel. What we are. And our children should pick that up. And the last thing we parents should do is to remind our teenagers of their past failures. Once you have forgiven them, forgiven them. You don't say, what a shame, you have failed again, you let me down again. 
I've seen parents doing that. In many of the casework I do, I've seen too many, many parents repeating that to their children. You have let me down again. You know what I mean? If you have forgiven them, let the past be the past. The next mistake, failure to discuss sensitive issues with our teenagers. Do, are there sensitive issues in your home? How many of you tell me you have sensitive issues in your home? Very sensitive one. So sensitive, you're going to put your hands. I tell you this, every family has sensitive issues. So do you agree? It's either interpersonal relationship or intrapersonal relationship. Let me tell you the difference. Uh, inter, I and T, E, R, right? It's between people and people. Intrapersonal is you and yourself. Intra, I'm teaching you a new word today. Intrapersonal. For example, if I constantly get angry, it is an intrapersonal issue. It's me and me alone, right? I constantly fall into temptation. It's intrapersonal. Let's say I see something, the last of the eye, the last of the flesh, the problem, and I fall into it. That is intrapersonal. Agree? But interpersonal is between people and people. So in every family, there will be sensitive issues. And I'm telling you, your children, your teenagers, will pick them up, will notice it. For example, let's say uh, husband and wife always quarrel over money. You can be sure your children will pick that up. Do you agree? Or mother-in-law, daughter-in-law issue. La. Heard of it? La. Mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. Our in-laws that became outlaws. Okay? Your children will pick up. You know what I mean? Uh, what else? Um, 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 church issues. You know church issue? Church issue can divide family also, you know? Okay? So there are a lot of sensitive issues. Your children being smart and sharp will detect those sensitive issues. And you have to be very careful when they bring up those subjects, uh, either dinner time or meal time or relaxing time, the way you respond is very important. I know of some parents who are usually very relaxed and everybody very happy until a sensitive issue is raised. Then suddenly, complete silence. You know silence? Complete silence. Or change topic straight away from FM 93.3 to some other issue, other frequencies. Change topic straight away. Or the house suddenly becomes frozen, like, you know, eyes, you know. Now, I want you to take note of this, that those moments when your children, your teenagers, huh, raise those issues, they are signaling to you that they want to engage you. Please remember, they are not there to make life difficult for you, to embarrass you. You following me? They want to engage you, what I call the teachable moments in a person's life. You know what about teachable moment? Teach. They add A, B, L, E. They are teachable. They sincerely want to engage you to find out what you think. Now, how you respond will determine your relationship with them. How you respond will enable you to capitalize on those moments. And I'm sure as wise parents, you want to capitalize on those teachable moments. They're teachable. You want to know what you think. Please remember to engage them. You see, whenever our teenagers fail to get the right answer or the accurate answer from, from us, they will come up with their own. Eh? They will search on their own. And today, the internet and other sources or their friends, they will provide all kinds of information. Do you agree? There's no lack. Teenagers actually, in the sense that they don't have a lack of information and resources one nah, with a computer, right? But if they do raise that topic during meal time, and it's usually meal time, and by the way, do you all have meal with the children? Nah? You have meal together or nah? not? Better keep the habit, nah? We are still Chinese, nah? not because we are Chinese. But because meal time is the best time to engage them. Nah. I don't know about you, it's the best time for me. Not that I put drugs into the food. No, 
during meal time when we are eating, right? Then if the food is good, we start with the food. Then we slowly move into other topic. You know what I mean? That's the best time to find out information. And those times when they raise those topics, right? Please engage them. You do not have to wait until you have all the answers. A lot of parents say, Mr. Girl, how to start, what to say, how to initiate the conversation. No, you don't have to. When they raise it, try to engage them. You see, your willingness to engage them is more important than the answer itself. They must sense this willingness to, to engage them. You know what I mean? Say, oh, but I don't have the answer. It's okay. Don't have answer. Don't have answer. No. But they must sense from your body language, from the look of your eyes, that you are willing to engage them. You are interested in their lives. And let me say this to you. Your children deserve your attention. It can be all kinds of sense. It could be money issues in some family, unresolved interpersonal issues. Even sometimes your children make you feel ignorant or prejudiced. But don't worry. That is only a feeling. They may even point out a habit that you have. Some of us say, but Mr. Gung, you're embarrassing me. I say, it's okay. It's worth the effort. Those teachable moments come and go. They will not always be around. When your, your kids reach the older age, right? They may not engage you anymore, you know. They can find answers on their own, you know. My three kids, huh? they are more powerful than, than me, you know, more powerful. They are more answers than me. Because they can find their own answers. But the moment they broach the subject, right? My antenna, yeah, yep, come out. Huh? Oh, so away, I switch on, you know. You need to switch on at the right time. Because those are teachable moments. You don't have to wait till you are absolutely confident. Or totally knowledgeable. You don't have to. You just... Take time to listen. And whatever you know, you tell them. Your willingness. Brothers and sisters, your willingness to engage is more important than the answer. You know, in Chinese, there's a proverb. Chang chang hou lang, tui qian lang. Too powerful or not? It means that in the Yangtze, Yangtze River, right, the back waves uh, propel the front wave forward. You know what that means? And that's how the waves move in the Yangtze River. It means that young people actually can be a motivating force to their own seniors. Because of their knowledge, right, they motivate us to learn more. You follow me? Because of their curiosity, because of their interest, they motivate us to move forward and to learn more. Now, the ninth mistake, which is very obvious, you probably agree with me, if not, then you are exceptional Singaporean. Failure to give time. You may say, well, Mr. Gung, I do give a lot of time. Well, let's see what kind of uh, time you give them in our kind of society. The COVID-19 could have slowed down. Thank God for COVID-19. It made us all stay at home and look at one another. Engage one another. Am I right? Am I not? Huh? No, don't go out, right? But some people still escape their home, no? I seen some up, some uncle, old uncle, at certain time, uh, still come down uh, with their mask on, uh, still go and drink, uh, don't know whatever they have. You know, they go and chit chat. Now, failure to give time. In Singapore, hurry uh, is the greatest enemy of relationship building. Hurry. I am a Russian. Because I rush all the time. I rush from one place to... I have the tendency to rush. That's why I'm called a Russian. I don't come from Russia. I'm a Chinese. But I tend to rush, so you can call me a Russian. Whenever I feel that people are long-winded or taking their own sweet time or wasting my time, I get easily agitated. It has to do with my personality. Okay? Sometimes I walk in a hurry in a night walk and leave my wife behind. I'm always afraid. Then I look around my wife. Sometimes I queue up and the queue is too slow moving. Or my schedule is upset. Or there's a traffic jam. I will find myself saying to myself, can you please hurry up? I do it all the time. And quite often I must confess to you that that can lead me to sin. 
and it can cause me a lot of problem because of my personality. Some years ago, I learned a lot from this particular episode. It's a true story. I got to counsel uh, a man who was in his 50s. His name was Mr. O. He had one teenage daughter. And this teenage daughter was very prone to depression. And one day, this girl who was 15 years old confided in her friends, a group of friends, that she wanted to commit suicide. The friends immediately notified the father, Mr. O. But it took Mr. O six hours to reach home. He finished his work, everything, then he reached home. He came home the evening and thankfully the daughter had given up suicide thoughts by then. She said, ah, hey, uh huh? But that father's failure the first time caused him great regret. One year later, one year later, the daughter jumped from her flat. The father was notified again, but he didn't take it seriously because first time he tried, she tried so. And this time, together with the wife, when they came to see me, I was heartbroken. A 15-year-old girl, 16 by then 16, would jump from the 16th floor of their condominium. Sad, right? Where's the father? The first time, he was six hours late. Then the daughter did not commit suicide. He did, she, he did not take her seriously. That is a case of a very busy father. What a waste. And parents, I put to you that there is an unfortunate coincidence in our parenting journey. Many of us, many of us parents of teenagers, are at the busiest of our career when our children are in their teenage years. We all CEO or CFO, or we're all at the top of a career. You know what I mean? Our career makes so much demand on us in our 50s, late 40s, and we are succeeding in our career. And our children in their teenage years can sense that we are very busy. Do you agree? You will know you're very busy. And you sense that you don't have time for them. So consciously or subconsciously, you and I are signaling to them that we don't have time. And when our children pick that up, they will not want to engage us. You know what I mean? Because dad and mom are so busy. And this, to me, is a tragic mistake in parenting teenagers. When our children sense that we are so busy, but you must remember that our children have the right to our time. They have every right. And you must signal to them, I am willing to listen. Because when you signal to them you're willing to listen, then they're willing to share with you. A lot of parents tell me, that their kids don't want to tell them, I say the fault is with you. Because you are so busy, you give them the message, you don't have time to listen. Love demands listening. One of the role of love, the manifestation of love, is listen. It starts with L. Do you know that when we tell God, speak to God, God listen? And because He loved us. I cannot imagine worshipping a God that does not listen to me, who has no time for me. I cannot imagine that. My God has time for me 24-7. Am I right? My God has time for me 24-7. My God is a listening God. That's why I pray. If you are willing to listen, then your kids are willing to share. You must send this signal, either verbally or through your body language. Yes, I have time for you. You must let them know that your children have priority of time and space in your lives. That is good enough reason. People talk about quality time. A lot of books written on that. But I say to you, if there's no quantity time, there will be no quality time. Quality and quantity both start with Q. If there isn't enough time invested, with your loved ones, there will be no quality time. Got it? So parents, no matter how busy you are, 
Remember that your children, your teenagers, will have teachable, receptive moments. And if you're willing to listen, they will be willing to tell you. But these moments come and go on. No? They're not permanent. Seize those moments. Make use of those moments. They are priceless moments. You find me like preaching very hard. Huh? This is my style. I'm, I'm more of a preacher than a family life educator. I tell you what is in my heart. Because those mistakes I make myself. <laughs> I make most of those mistakes. I was a busy man. I was busy as a pastor, as a church worker, as a full-time Christian worker. I had to work at it. And today, I wish the many, many of the mistakes I make, I need not make them. Lah. You know what I mean? So I'm sh sharing with you what I went through. Okay, the next one. And to me, this is the most important takeaway. If you can forget about all the rest I've said, please don't forget this. Failure. To love your teenagers unconditionally. I want you to look at this transparency. No, this OH, uh, these slides. Huh? What do you see there? This, this father, what do you see there? Tell me what, what is on his face. He's saying something very harsh, no? Very merciless. True or not? I hope none of us will have to reach that stage. But in the course of my work in youth guidance, I've come across this kind of cases. It shows a very frustrated, disappointed, hurting father. True? His heart must be broken. Question is, why was he so heartless and so unforgiving? He's telling the son, I'm cutting off my relationship with you, right? Okay? I mean, I want to have nothing to do with you. Probably the teenagers have made mistakes, the same mistakes again and again. The father is saying in a nutshell to the boy, I want to have nothing to do with you. Agree? I mean, I just cannot bear to, to see you. Lah. Again, there was a true story. It was back then. I was working with uh, young men and young girls uh, in the boys' home and the girls' home, and those who were sentenced to RTC. You know what's RTC? Reformy Training Center. Okay, if you step in, you'll find all those with tattoos and all that. Okay, drugs, and they have they have gone to fights. I was involved in this case. I was called upon to intervene. Um, in, a, in a case where these teenagers had joined gangs, got into many fights, arrested by the police a number of times. He got himself into trouble again and again. And the mother and father were also not a very good relationship. And the mother, who was very heartbroken, came to see me and asked if I could help uh, to talk to the father. Because in a couple of days' time, the, the son will be sentenced by the juvenile court. You know the juvenile court? It's a court for those who are, the ages of it will be under 16. And it was for sure, he was advised by the police that after the sentencing, he will go to RTC. The judge would definitely send him, because this time the crime was serious now, and he did not show signs of improvement. But the son, before he was sentenced, he asked to, for both his parents to be present at the court sentencing. And the mother was ready to attend the court sentencing, but the father was not willing. I spoke to the father and he told me that this son of mine is gone and beyond hope. And the father did not turn up at the court hearing. And the son went into JLTC very sad, very hurt. It was like the father gave up on hope on him. Now this kind of heartbreaking story is not rare. It happened in some families and usually it happened between father and son. Usually not mother and son. Mothers, most mothers I've come across are hurt, but most mothers will not cut ties with their children. I do not fully understand why. It had to do with perhaps the maternal instincts of what God gives to mother. You know what I mean? But some men can be very hard. And this man is saying, Now, to me, the father had displayed conditional love. 
he hoped and he wanted the son to repent and to change. And I do understand that parents can really be hurt and be in great pain when their teenagers refuse to change or refuse to mend their ways and they break our hearts again and again. It is very easy to love them when they are obedient and teachable, right? They're quite quiet, a boy, a girl. But what happened when they're always breaking our hearts? I believe that the unconditional love, which is humanly impossible, is called for during those moments. But to put it differently, I'm asking all of us here this afternoon, never, never, never abandon your teenagers no matter what happened. Never abandon them in your heart. You are their only hope. Because I work with these kids who were abandoned by their parents. Because your rejection and your cutting of ties will be the last straw. It is very difficult to restore them, to rehabilitate these, these teenagers, even though you're a good social worker or a counsellor. Restore them from a life of crimes and violence when their own parents give up on them. You're the last straw. So as parents, we need to remember that our kids, for all that the nonsense and all that they have done, they are still your flesh and blood. They deserve your unconditional love. So what is unconditional love? What is it? Well, let me say it clearly again. Unconditional love is a love that differentiates between the behavior of a person and the person himself. That as a parent, you must remember that the behavior of the person and the person can be quite different. Your teenager's behavior and actions may break your heart. You can even reject certain behavior. But remember, the same teenager is still your child. Eh? Your relationship with that teenager can never change. Parent and child can never change. Love them. Love them for whom they are, even if their lifestyles and their behavior are not acceptable. Love them for whom they are, not for what they do. This is unconditional love. And now I want to read to you, taken from a 16-year-old boy diary. This is a real diary, yeah? okay? Taken, huh? When this boy wrote this, diary, this page, he was 16 years old. This is what he wrote. I want you to listen very carefully. <clears throat> from young, my father took control of the family like a ritualistic priest. Disobedience to him would be seen as a sin. At a very young age, I was taught to recite scriptural texts from the Bible and learn to meditate all its morals, even though my innocent mind was not mature enough for religious philosophy. My father was a zealous devotee and would definitely sacrifice his family for the sake of God's work. The only fond memories of my childhood are usually spent with my mother, while the nightmares of abuses and anguish are usually committed by my father. Despite his outbursts of unreasonable temper, my father always had a logical explanation for what he did, therefore making one think that he or she is in the wrong. I remember once he barred me from playing a toy that I clearly wanted. He whipped me late in the night and forced me to kneel down till my knees cracked, just like the classical Jekyll and Mr. Hyde tale. He would turn good and dry my tears and tell me he had forgiven me for a wrong I would never know. What kind of father was that? In the eyes of the sun, abusive father, right? This recording is taken from my eldest son diary when he was 16. This was taken from my own son's diary. It broke my heart. It broke my heart when I read it some 20 years after he wrote it. I got to read the diary and I asked him for his permission to read it out to you today. I, standing before you, 
sharing with you the mistakes that I made. I was overcome with shame, guilt, and regrets. Hearing that from my son's diary. And obviously, I have been an abusive and unloving father in the eyes of my boy. Would you think so? Abusive. And you guess what my first reaction when I read my son's diary? What was my first reaction? Denial. Eh? I denied, no. Who can learn? That was not me, okay? It was nothing. It was my son's anger and his childish thoughts. How can it be? My son was exaggerating. Denial. I denied. 20 years later, I denied. But the Lord did not condone my denials. But it's, I soon realized that no matter how wrong my son was, there were shades of truth in what a child saw in his own father. He must have seen some part of me that made him right that way. I have committed grave mistakes in my fathering role. Now that he's 39, if you ask me, I thank God for a good relationship I have with him today. Both Lily and myself are very proud of him. And I'm still learning to be a godly father. I pull this out to read to you, brothers and sisters, to show you that I'm just like you. I make mistakes. I shouldn't be here, in fact, to be telling you all this. Perhaps many fathers have not committed the same mistakes as I did. But we all have made mistakes, regardless of how sincere and dedicated we have been. But I want you to know that with Christ in the picture, there's hope for all of us. There's hope for all of us. We can start all over again. And my grand conclusion for this workshop is, is this. No matter how much workshops you've attended, how many books you have read, you and I need to remember that our primary responsibility is not to grace godly children, but to be a godly parent myself, to be a godly parent yourself. Be the man or the woman God wants you to be. I always say that being precedes doing. You may say, in God, I want to raise godly children, but to begin with, are you a godly man and a godly woman? Good parenting skills can be learned from books and other resources. But to begin with, be the godly father or mother that God wants you to be. I'm going to ask parents, couples here, husband and wife, if you can sit together and hold hand and dedicate our parenting roles to the Lord. Do you mind? Ken? I know that this workshop perhaps has spoken to you. The Lord has used this workshop to speak to your hearts. Can you hold on as husband and wife or those of you who are with your spouses? And let's close our eyes, bow our heads. If indeed this workshop has been used by the Lord to minister to you, can you pray this in your heart? Dear God, thank you for blessing us with teenage children. We confess that we have made mistakes along the way. though we might have good intentions as parents. Please help us learn from our mistakes. Please, Lord, help us learn from our mistakes and never to use our failures as an excuse for not trying again. Thank you, Lord, for loving our own children even more than we do. As an act of faith, 
We want to dedicate our parenting roles to you now so that you will be glorified in our homes, in our families. In Jesus' name. Amen.